Hey everyone, welcome to the first installment of Re-Reviews. This is a series that I've been meaning to make for a little while now, so I'm trying to stop procrastinating and start doing. The idea of a re-review is basically to take a game that I had played when it first came out, go back to it, and see if anything changed, either in my perception of it or in any additional content that came out, what it looks like essentially in its final form. This is actually more useful now than ever before because we have add-on content and live service updates and all of that good stuff, I guess? And this gives us a chance to look at games in their final form, do a deep dive on them, and really see if they have held up over the course of time. And so I figured that I would start with the game that actually inspired me to do this series. And so, without further ado, Re-Reviews! Assassin's Creed Origins. Pre-Review! Basically, the idea of a pre-review is to talk about the game before it came out, because, let's face it, if we're going to do a deep dive and we want to be thorough, we're going to be thorough. <laughs> In the case of Origins, it means that we have to talk about the Assassin's Creed series up to that point. Once upon a time, there was a game called Prince of Persia Sands of Time, also made by Ubisoft. Developers at the company had seen that and said, hey, that's great, but what if it was an open world game? Thus, Assassin's Creed is born. Now, that's actually the official story from Ubisoft, although I feel like when you actually look at those games, there is more complexity to it. And that Ubisoft had really pulled from other series that they were already working on. Mainly, in this case, Beyond Good and Evil and Splinter Cell. You know, when I say Beyond Good and Evil, I'm really talking about, number one, the open world aspects and how they were implemented, being able to have a central protagonist that does a bunch of different things, uh, and how the world is fleshed out. When it comes to Splinter Cell, that's actually a closer correlation. Prince of Persia itself really didn't have any stealth or tactical aspects. It was mostly about the parkour and about the fighting. And so, yeah, those do end up in Assassin's Creed, but there's also this huge emphasis on stealth and tactical thinking, which is totally what they did in Splinter Cell, as well as having a whole host of gadgets and being able to tackle situations in multiple ways. Yeah. But as far as the official story goes, it was an outgrowth of Sands of Time, specifically. The team over at Ubisoft was actually pretty tight-lipped about the overarching story that they were developing for it. Uh, if you go back and look at some of the uh, archived interviews from that time, they had mentioned like that glitching effect that we're now used to from Assassin's Creed, but they didn't really say what that was all about. Now, of course, we know that there's this big overarching storyline that has to do with assassins and Templar and the animus that you get put into and reliving your ancestors' memories. We learn about Abstergo Industries and what they're trying to do to get precursor artifacts. And we get introduced to our main protagonist in the modern era, Desmond Miles, whose story would be explored over the next five games. That first installment of Assassin's Creed, though, does feel a little bit like a tech demo, especially when you see later installments. But then again, that's not atypical of Ubisoft. I would take Watch Dogs if you're looking for another example. Usually by the second installment, they really improve upon the formula. And that's definitely the case with Assassin's Creed. AC2 is still one of the best installments in the series. My, my own opinion, just saying. But what eventually happens is after we get through Assassin's Creed 3, Desmond Miles' story wraps up. And then, we have more games. The characters you were playing in the game's past that were basically nameless, faceless protagonists, and it all basically revolved around Abstergo Entertainment. Because, of course, Abstergo Industries isn't there anymore. No, the Templar are gone. Don't worry about it. It's fine. No, they're totally behind the scenes anyway. But the thing is, you were playing this character basically through their eyes, and you had a tablet in front of you, and you inadvertently ended up being incredibly important to each and every story that was being told. But I did miss having one central protagonist in the modern day that we could see go through multiple games. And that just basically dropped off after AC3. The fact that Assassin's Creed was so popular right out of the gate meant that 
they had to start churning out as many games as they possibly could, and it basically became an annualized series. You could expect at least one AC game every year. In fact, there was one particular year where we ended up with two. We had Unity and Rogue that were released in the same year. That was peak Assassin's Creed saturation, and it did not do the series any favors. Unity was widely panned. Rogue fared better, but still, it was obvious that they were having some problems in the, the time frame that they were putting into it, the work and, and the effort that they were putting into individual titles, so we didn't have huge hopes for Syndicate, which would be the last release before Origins. Syndicate was actually pretty good. Media outlets liked it. Users seemed to like it. Overall, very positive reviews, but it wasn't selling as well. In fact, it vastly underperformed. Realizing that the trend was going down, Ubisoft realized that maybe it was time to go back to the drawing board, and so that's what they decided to do. They took a year off from this annualized series to put more time in on their next project. Now, unbeknownst to me, they were actually working on Origins from as far back as Black Flag. So that was AC4. So they had actually been working on this for several years, but they realized that taking one more year off in order to refine it was going to be immensely beneficial to the game. The statement that Ubisoft made was basically, we want to emphasize the quality of our individual releases. That's a very prosumer move, and I'm actually very happy when I hear game companies talk about that, but I'm sure they were also looking at the economics of it. I mean, they had reached a point where their supply of Assassin's Creed games had outweighed the demand for Assassin's Creed games, which means that they were going to sell less and less copies every single year. They were just producing too many games for the market. And when you're going to take time off to really revitalize a series, it can go in either direction. The really good thing is obvious. You know, you improve the things that the series needed to improve upon. The bad thing goes in a ton of different directions. Either you make changes people don't like, you make too many changes, and you alienate people who like the series because it doesn't feel like the series anymore. You risk doing too little, and then people go, but I thought you were going to go back and revitalize the game. You really put yourself in a very tricky situation at that point. Overall, I was pretty positive about what they were doing, but I was still taking it with a grain of salt. So on pre-review, I give Origins a 6 out of 10. Review! That's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's me talking about the game when I first played it. In my perspective, Origins ends up doing a lot of things right. The overall look and feeling and also the playability of the game had vastly improved. I think that they made some huge strides forward in the user interface and how players were able to interact with the world. They had one continuous map that you could go to from one side to the other, so you could explore all of ancient Egypt by horse if you wanted to. That was not always true of every Assassin's Creed game. There were several different iterations where you would travel from one city, fast travel to another city, and it wasn't really one cohesive map. It was sort of like smaller open world areas. Not in Origins, no. All of ancient Egypt was laid out before you. Enjoy. It has to be one of the most stunning recreations of ancient Egypt that they may ever do. And that's not nothing. I mean, the landscape is just so epic. You know, you have the Lighthouse of Alexandria, you have the Great Library, pour one out. You have the pyramids, you have the Sphinx, you have all of these amazing set pieces. All of Alexandria is laid out before you. By traveling through these cities and towns, you just get to see daily life and people are just going about their business. And it's pretty great. It feels like a lived-in world. Oh, they also implemented something else that was really interesting called photo mode. You know, at any time in your game, you could just pause the action and just rotate around your character and just take pictures of the landscape and then you could just share them with the community. It was just a nice little touch. We create this rich landscape and now we'll let people take photos of it. Sure. Your central character, Bayek, is also really great. He's a medje, essentially a protector of Siwa Oasis, who gets drawn into this much bigger conflict that is basically the precursor story to the Templar and the Assassins. And that's the other thing I really liked about Origins, is that it takes place before all the events of the other Assassin's Creed games, way before any of it. One of the best reasons to ever do a prequel is if you can tell a unique story in the same world without having to worry about all the canon that's been built up. 
That's what they did with KOTOR, and I would talk a lot more about that, but if I do, that's going to be the rest of the video, so back to Origins. For the most part, that's exactly what they do. They're able to tell a unique story that doesn't have a lot of the baggage that you might have found from previous games. So if you were new to the series, this is a great new starting point for you. And Bayek is a bit of a conflicted character. I mean, he is a character born out of duty and honor, but because of personal tragedy, he ends up hunting down this shadowy organization. Personal tragedy is like the backstory for half of the assassins in Assassin's Creed, just for the record. You also get to meet Aya, who is Bayek's wife. She's gone through the same tragedy he has, but she takes it in a little bit of a different route. You do get to play Aya a little bit in some seafaring missions that are sort of, they break up the gameplay a little bit, but you don't actually get to actively play her while you're, you know, traveling around Egypt. I think that that's a little bit of a missed opportunity, but I'll explain why in a bit. Aya also essentially becomes our conduit into the major political struggle that's going on in this area at this time, which is between Egypt and Rome, two very large civilizations that are having a bit of trouble playing well together. There's also a third civilization that I always think about in this particular conflict, which is Greece, although it is pretty obvious that Greece doesn't have a lot of actual power or influence, but what they had built is definitely represented. I mean, Aya is Greek, so we have uh, one Greek character and one Egyptian character in Bayek that are essentially like our central figures in the storyline. But it's obvious that the main conflict here is between Rome and Egypt, and so we get to meet a lot of central figures in there. We get to meet Caesar, Cleopatra, Ptolemy, and if you know your history, which I certainly don't, it doesn't seem to end well for any of them. But in the moment, none of the characters know that, so you really do get to feel like you're discovering it with them. Oh, and you know how I said I missed having a central protagonist in the modern day? Well, they go back to it in this game. You meet Layla Hassan, who has gone rogue from Abstergo and basically built her own animus so that she could track down precursor artifacts because she was worried what would happen if the Templar got a hold of them. I have heard some people say that they'd like the Assassin's Creed series to just drop the modern day component altogether, but I think it actually lends to the relevance of the series. And it's not overbearing. It's enough that you can get an idea for those characters, see them through at certain intervals of the storyline, and understand what the immediacy of this entire thing is. In terms of gameplay, they made some really big strides forward. First of all, you get your own eagle, Senu. Having an eagle allows you to just on the fly, <laughs> pun totally intended, you get to mark different targets and stuff like that, which, you know, gives you the bird's eye view, also pun intended, of the landscape, which is terrific. It was so much more natural to do that than the synchronization points that they had in other games. Of course, they also still had synchronization points in these games so that you could have fast travel, but, you know, it's a step. One of the big changes they made, though, is that they overhauled the combat system, which it desperately needed. Um, it still didn't sing, for me at least. It, it wasn't super tight, but it did give you a lot more options for combat. Used to be that you basically had an attack and a dodge and like a counter for most Assassin's Creed games, and in this one, you had light attacks, heavy attacks, you had different kinds of weapons that you could use. Some of them were short range, but they were fast. Some of them were long range, but they were slow. Each weapon functioned differently and would change your fighting style, depending on what you picked. You had four different kinds of bows that actually all functioned completely differently. One of them functions like a sniper rifle. One of them's like a shotgun. One of them's like a semi-automatic rifle. <laughs> And it would change some of your play styles and options by picking different kinds of weapons, which does add a lot of diversity to combat. But again, it's also an Assassin's Creed game, so you figure that stealth is supposed to be first and foremost, so it does feel a little strange that combat got such an overhaul. The thing that is hard to get used to is the fact that because of the leveling system that they put in, you didn't necessarily uh, make an assassination every time you went to assassinate somebody. Like, that was just kind of like par for course in all the other games, is I've pulled off an assassination attack, my opponent's dead. Well, now because of levels, you know, if they're high enough level, you, you just kind of wound them, and then you have to keep going in active combat. It takes some getting used to, but I didn't really mind the leveling system and the skills that they put in. I was actually used to them from Syndicate, but they did a much, much more detailed job when it came to Origins. 
So you have different skill trees and different things that you can specialize in, and you can keep building up your character as you get enough experience, and it feels more like a role-playing game, which, yeah, it does feel like it's a big change for the series, but I don't necessarily think of it as a bad one. I think it actually just lends itself to character development. But we should also talk about the actual missions that you go on. There's plenty of stuff to do, plenty of side quests, plenty of main quests, and plenty of just activities to do around the world. Forts that you can complete objectives in, etc. Ubisoft has a way of doing like five basic kinds of missions that they just spam over and over and over again in their open worlds. But the thing is, if it's fun and engaging, I don't necessarily mind it so much. They always find a way to change it up just enough that it feels like a new experience. So no fort really is tackled the same way as any other fort, but you may start to feel like you are indeed doing the same activities over and over and over again. But I mean, I would say with the hours of enjoyment that you get out of that model before it truly becomes a slog, it's still worth it. It works. Overall, I would say that Origins exceeded expectations. It also ended up being one of the best entries in the series up to that point, and I would say that it gets a very well-deserved 8 out of 10 on review. Re-review! You knew we had to get to it at some point. There are a lot of things to consider when we talk about a re-review, but the first thing I want to tackle is additional content. The first one is Hidden Ones, which I, I honestly won't talk very much about. You go to Sinai, and uh, there's some more story missions, some more side quests, but it's basically the same thing that you did in the main game. There's not really new elements to speak of. Your level cap goes up just a little bit, but that's basically it. However, the same cannot be said for Curse of the Pharaohs, which actually does implement all of these new things that are more based on Egyptian mythology. Throughout the main game, you had heard Bayek talk about the Field of Reeds when he tracked down assassination targets. In this game, you actually get to go to the Field of Reeds, as well as like all of these other places that are mythologically part of the Egyptian afterlife, and you get to fight the Pharaohs, who are coming back like as undead entities. There are giant scorpions, there are jackal guards, there's like all of this interesting stuff that you would not have gotten from the main gaming experience. Granted, a lot of its content was still the same basic like five activities that you're used to doing, but they at least added some new elements into it. But the best new addition, at least for me, was Discovery Tour. Basically what they did is they said, hey, let's create a mode for you to go into where you can just explore the same landscape that you've been exploring, playing the game and everything, but there's no combat. You can't die. You can jump off the highest mountain. You can go to the deepest sea. You're not going to drown. You're not going to damage yourself in any way, shape, or form. You can walk right up to a lion, look it in the face, and it's just going to look at you quizzically. And now you just have this giant sandbox world of ancient Egypt that you are free to explore at your leisure and learn about. There are so many walking tours that you can go on where you explore the daily life of Egyptians. You get to explore the, the creation of the pyramids. It's an amazing resource, and it seems to make perfect sense for Assassin's Creed that continuously takes you to these amazing locations in time and place. I really wish that they would do this for every entry into the future, but I don't think that they're going to do it for Odyssey. I, I don't know. They're probably going to try to integrate the historical facts into the main game itself from here on out. But that's unfortunate, because being able to just go around as literally any character from the game, you know, if you want to play Caesar, run around as Caesar. Or if you want to be Ptolemy and act like a brat all day, you can do that too. Or hey, you could just play Layla and just go around like you're Indiana Jones, revisiting the past. And all these tours are great. They actually teach you all about this ancient world and all the facets therein and the civilizations that built it. They even do some behind-the-scenes stuff where they talk about the artistic licenses that they had to take in some ways to make it a game. One of the best examples actually does come when you go to the Great Library of Alexandria. Pour another one out! They had no historical record of what the library looked like, so they had to look at other libraries that would have been in adjacent cities in order to get an idea of the architectural style, and then they used that to create what they think the Great Library looks like. But it's all very fascinating. It was either free if you had the game, or you could buy it separately, which was actually a very smart move on Ubisoft's part. Because you can imagine that being in classrooms, 
How much fun would it be like if you say, hey students, you want to play an Assassin's Creed game for history lessons? Yes, please. And with the sheer amount of archaeologists, Egyptologists, historians, and such that they work with, it's probably the most accurate version of ancient Egypt you will ever see. If you were looking for challenges too, they also started doing like these live events where you could essentially take on the gods of Egypt through these animus glitches, so that's good if you want a challenge. As far as gameplay, there was one thing I noticed when I went back and looked at it again that I was not aware of the first time. Stealth is hard! Like, if you step out of a bush and one guard sees you, immediately, boom, you're in combat and everybody is on top of you. I mean, it makes sense because they overhauled the combat, so obviously, in order to show that off, you have to get players into combat more often, but it's just not something that I was really used to in the series. As a result, I realized that, like, whipping out a predator bow, which is basically the sniper rifle one that I talked about, and just trying to pick people off from as far away with headshots was probably your best option. It's effective, but it's usually not what you think about when you think about AC. But the biggest problem I found with the game was that it already feels dated. And this is mostly because we already have another installment in the series, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And trust me, I didn't think I'd like Odyssey, uh, because it had sharks, and the second you bring those toothy devils into the picture, I'm not playing anymore. It's the reason why I only got up to a certain point in Black Flag, and then they were like, hey, here's an underwater mission, and I'm like, nope, I think I'm tapping out, that's good. I mean, I've played, like, every Assassin's Creed game that ever came to consoles, but it doesn't mean I've completed every Assassin's Creed game, especially when either I get bored, or they introduce sharks. However, once I realized in Odyssey that I could basically avoid sharks altogether and complete the main storyline, I was like, oh, all right. But so many of the things that they introduced in Origins, they had already improved upon with Odyssey. You could actually assign a wide variety of skills to your character to pull off in combat, so that vastly customizes your experience in active melee. And remember how I said that there were like four different bows you could pick from in Origins? Well, when they got around to Odyssey, they said, hey, let's just make those skills, and you can just invest points in those skills, and you can basically hotkey them, and you can just do all of those different things. You don't have to swap between different bows. It's also the reason I realized how tricky stealth is in Origins, because having played Odyssey, you actually get skills that make it easier to pull off stealth attacks, and improve your stealth attacks. So, assassination, again, becomes more of a priority in that game. Which makes sense, because it's Assassin's Creed. And, oh, wow, once they give you the ability, like, by the time you get to, like, level 20, they just give you the ability to literally jump off whatever cliff that you want and take absolutely no falling damage, and you never knew how much you wanted that until they give it to you. Because it is revolutionary. I mean, there was just a lot to do. The landscape was bigger, there were more activities. Yeah, there's still basically the same five activities that we had before, but there's more of it. They implemented naval combat, and they, they streamlined a lot of stuff in that game. And the truth is, this shouldn't affect Origins on its own merits, but it just does, because if you've already played Odyssey and you go back to play Origins, you'll ask yourself, well, why can't I do these things like I could in that game? Well, that game's newer. And, unfortunately, Assassin's Creed has always been, in some way, a victim of its own success. You know, because they're constantly coming out with new installments in the series, every singular installment really doesn't have a very long shelf life. It doesn't take long before any one of those games feels kind of stale, and that might be the reason why they're constantly trying to go back and remaster a lot of the old games, so that they can get, like, a new audience now. You know, they're doing all of these remasters mostly so that they can do quality of life improvements, and they can add stuff in, and they can also up it so it looks better. But if you were to play them in their original state, I actually had just done this with Rogue. It was from the last generation, it wasn't the remaster. You'll notice that a lot of the stuff doesn't feel like it holds up very well. I mean, the storyline might, the characters might, but the overall gameplay is gonna start to feel 
kind of outdated. And with such a fast turnaround that they do for this series, which I understand they have to do, that's like, because the series is popular and they have to keep pumping out games for it, the problem is is that installments that came before start to feel underwhelming. That really stinks for Origins because it had a lot of great stuff going for it, and I would still say has plenty of merit in the modern spectrum, even though Odyssey is out there. It was able to breathe new life into this series that really needed a shot in the arm, and it gave it that. Plus, great things like Discovery Mode, and even some of the new content that they put into, like, Curse of the Pharaohs, really helped to extend its life. But sadly, even though it's only been a couple years since its release, it's already lost some of its luster. On re-review, I give Assassin's Creed Origins a 7 out of 10. It's almost as good as I remember it, but mm, not quite. I'm going to give you a little TLDR recap with the scores on the screen so that you can see essentially the progression of my relationship with this game. If you have never played Origins, I do highly recommend trying it out and seeing what you think. There's a lot of great content in it, and just, just Egypt alone, that is the central character of this game, and it is amazing. Thank you everybody for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. It gives me a chance to actually talk about games in more depth and really just kind of go through the entire process, dissect it a little bit more, and, and I at least like to be able to do that. I've been trying to figure out what format I could take, and, and I think I like this one. The next re-review that I plan on doing is for Stardew Valley, just because I love to have the opportunity, nay, excuse, to talk about that game, but also with like the multiplayer updates and updates that they're still doing to the game. There's actually some stuff that we can discuss. Thank you for watching, and as always, don't forget to dislike and unsubscribe. You can do the opposite, too. I'm using reverse psychology on you today. Is it working? Probably not. All right, everyone, thank you for watching to the end, and we will see you on the next re-review. There's also something else about Odyssey that made me rethink something in Origins, which I was actually surprised by. In Odyssey, you can play as a male or female character. You can play Cassandra, and you can play Alexios, and they're, they're brother and sister, so you can take either path, and they're going on the same basic journey. So it actually made sense that you could play either one of those characters. Then you go back to Origins, and you realize Bayek and his wife Aya, they're set up at the very beginning as a husband and wife, who have gone through the same tragedies, go through the same story arc. You know, they have different places that they are, but they hit the same basic story beats. They are warriors of comparable skill to each other, and at the end of this whole journey, they're both critical in founding the Brotherhood. I guess that there would have been some problems with, you know, where she is. She's not always with him, so they don't run quite tandem. But it does feel like it wouldn't have taken very much so that you could have chose to play Aya. It's just one of those things that I started thinking about after playing Odyssey. Again, because with the benefit of time, you start thinking about these things. I almost wonder if one of the reasons why they did that in Odyssey is because they realized that they had a missed opportunity. Because it really does feel like they almost set her up to be a playable assassin character. And then she just wasn't one. I mean, I'm not going to hold it against the game, but it is something that like came to the front of my mind going back now. So I, I thought I would mention it.